When Chappelle Corby's lawyers pressed for information, Qantas Airways provided the total weights of her bags. Independent researchers cross-checked these against the maximum weight thresholds for her flight. Chappelle Corby's bags were found to be 5 kilos overweight on the Qantas system, but she had checked them in underweight. No excess charge had been levied. According to the records, 5 kilos have been added to her official weight after check-in. Neither Qantas, the AFP or the government ever provided Chappelle Corby this vital information. Hidden World Films informed her family in 2011. It's important to set the context. Here we had a young Australian woman before a foreign court whose life depended upon a very credible defense that drugs were placed in her bag by corrupt airport baggage handlers. There was a significant amount of evidence to support that. But suddenly, just a few weeks before the verdict, the head of the Australian Federal Police told the media that, quote, there is very little intelligence to suggest that baggage handlers are using innocent people to traffic heroin or other drugs between states." End quote. In itself, that was staggering. Its timing could not have been worse, and its impact on Chappelle Corby was devastating. The President of Law Council of Australia himself felt moved to comment on this. Quote, it was potentially damaging to the Corby defense, as it will no doubt be transmitted to Bali. End quote. With Chappelle Corby's lawyer referring to it as, quote, an absolute disgrace." End quote. But with the advantage of hindsight, we can also now see that it made no operational sense either. In fact, it totally contradicted what was actually happening on the ground, so much so that many suggest that it was a political statement engineered by the government. For a start, the AFP VN operation known as Operation Mocha were actually in the process of investigating the very thing which Chappelle Corby's lawyer was suggesting. Former head of Australian Federal Police anti-organized crime operations, Ray Cooper, revealed that it was well known amongst his colleagues that unwitting passengers were regularly used as mules to traffic narcotics. Police were linked to those operations. There were narcotics, particularly cannabis, being moved from airport to airport by syndicates and the baggage handlers were playing a key role in it. These dates, investigators revealed of the Operation Mocker drug bust, were based on the work rosters of the corrupt baggage handlers at Sydney Airport. That very exact same day, Chappelle Corby flew from Brisbane to Sydney, then on to Bali. 4.2 kilograms of cannabis were discovered in her boogie board bag at Nurarai Airport, Bali. the baggage handler Mocha operation was later arrested for conspiring to import 160 million dollars of precursor drugs into Australia. So we also appear to have corrupt police on the scene, another development for which the parameters and boundaries were unknown. Well, now the arrest of a top Australian drug investigator, Mark Standen, was arrested at his desk over a conspiracy to produce 120 million dollars worth of the drug ice. Huge amounts of money, huge amounts of drugs. I've been told repeatedly since the mid 1970s, uh, it began with the Stuart Royal Commission and other Royal Commissions, that uh, the Narcotics Bureau of that time uh, had permeated mainstream policing and the federal police. But this is a this is a two two pronged problem. It's one about the State Crime Commission, but it's also a problem about the Australian Federal Police. Why has this been able to happen uh, without the public knowing? Well, you'd have to ask your media colleagues that because uh, there's been no shortage of attempts to let the media know. Uh, there's been no shortage of information. This was one of the biggest drug-related operations in the history of Australian policing. And Mr Keelty was well aware of it when he made that statement. 
He must also have been aware that the full parameters and boundaries of the airport drug syndication ring were unknown. So even at this level, his statement surely verges on the ridiculous from an operational perspective. Not only were the police actually investigating baggage handler corruption, but exactly the same thing had previously happened to others. Corby's defence team claimed there were baggage handlers at both Sydney and Brisbane airports smuggling drugs. But the federal police completely dismissed the accusations. Then came the bombshell. The same thing had happened before. But this Melbourne couple were lucky enough not to be searched by Indonesian customs. In June 1997, eight years ago, Dee and Steve were unpacking after their flight to Bali when they were stunned to find a large block of compressed marijuana in their luggage. When we got to the motel room, my wife opened up the case, um, yelled out my name. I turned around and she had a package of marijuana in her hands, probably similar to the size of a loaf of bread. Just a big plastic bag and um, it was all quite firm and, and packed. The Melbourne couple reported their find to an Australian consulate official in Bali and his response left them stunned. Give me the bad news. He goes, well, you get caught with that, mate, and you'll be eating nosy goring for the rest of your life in jail. Um, and he suggested that I just throw it, flush it down the toilet, flush the whole lot down the toilet, get it out of, the, out of my possession, and don't go to the authorities under any circumstances at all. And their call was confirmed by the Australian consulate last week, after their story became public. And more. Alan Kessing never wanted to speak out about anything until he wrote a report damning the security at Sydney Airport. When the report was leaked, the damage went all the way to the top. Alan Kessing, bag packed, ready to go to jail for leaking a confidential report about slack security at Sydney Airport. It all began when, as a top customs investigator, he was selected to research dangerous holes in security at Sydney's airports. But two years later, when Kessing's confidential reports were leaked to the media, he was charged and tried. Found guilty of whistleblowing, Kessing was convicted under the notorious Commonwealth Crimes Act. Drafted in the overwrought era at the start of World War I to prevent the release of secret information, the Crimes Act still operates in the same way today. In, in by pointing out all the failings that it was going to cost uh, the airlines and uh, more to the point the privatised airport corporation um, big bucks to rectify. Now the point about it is that the rectification would merely have brought them in line with the requirements of the Customs Act but nonetheless they were rejected purely for commercial reasons and we were told that straight out. When I uh, first heard of my reports being leaked two and a half years after the, I wrote them. My first thought was, I think that was 31st of May, and unfortunately Chappelle would have been convicted on the 27th of May of 2005. My first thought was, somebody obviously had this story. Why didn't they, re they publish the story whilst the trial was still going on? And it is, it is well known. They use it, the corrupted personnel behind the lines in the baggage handling or wherever are using the domestic airports to smuggle drugs between the state capitals for instance. That, yes. 
it's always been from the very bottom, from the cleaners, the guys that push around mops and buckets, uh, right up to the top, whether it's the commercial side, such as the, the airline staff themselves, or even some customs officers, I mean, or quarantine for that matter. But when I came back on duty in 2005, and when, the, when Chappelle Corby was on trial, and those officers who hadn't already resigned were absolutely consumed with, with anger, there's no other word for it, sheer fury that reports that we had submitted to point out exactly these vulnerabilities had now resulted in, in this, which we've warned against over and over and over. It's, it's just um, a disgrace from beginning to end, the fact that this information was well known to customs officers and AFP for years, as is demonstrated by the occasional busts reported in the media in the late part of 2004 and the early part of 2005, showing imports of drugs using corrupt handlers or corrupt staff at the airport, and yet you can make a statement like that when somebody's life is in the balance over in, in Bali. It's just outrageous. If the Australian authorities had acknowledged to the Balinese court that there was significant doubt about the case, if they had simply admitted that the airport was full of holes, that baggage handlers were notoriously corrupt, as been, had been shown time and again in the previous months and, and even the previous year of drug importations using corrupt handlers, it must have cast massive doubt on any absurd notion that she was guilty. It could not have possibly have sustained a conviction with this knowledge. But the, the really awful thing about it is that if the, my reports had been acted upon when they were written two years previously, this situation would, should never have arisen. But the mere fact that these reports were suppressed for the worst of reasons, the cost to commercial entities and somebody is paying for it basically with their, their life and their sanity now is an absolute outrage. and more. Gary Lee Rogers was a police officer who became a high profile whistleblower when he alleged drug running at Sydney Airport and corruption within the AFP. He predicted that he would be murdered because of what he had discovered. Gary Lee Rogers, Assistant Inspector for Australian Protective Services, which was responsible for airport security until 2002, was assaulted by his work colleagues after blowing the whistle on Sydney airport corruption. I am in fear of my life, Lee Rogers wrote to Whistleblowers Australia. Today, at 1400 hours, I received an anonymous phone call, Gary Lee Rogers continued, saying that I had tripped over evidence of drug importation through Sydney Airport involving the old Commonwealth Police Network. He sought a meeting with the Attorney General regarding his discoveries, but before this could be arranged, he was found dead. On October 1st, 2002, Gary Lee Rogers was found dead in his flat with a blood-stained knife, bloody pillow and two white plastic bottles in his right hand. To the shock of his family, campaigners and observers, the coroner decided that this was death by natural causes. The coroner also placed what had been called a gagging order upon proceedings and witnesses. Whistleblowers Australia sent some information to Chappelle Corby's lawyers, who complained repeatedly that the AFP were refusing to cooperate and were engaged in the cover-up. Whistleblowers Australia directly referred to Commissioner Kelty's apparent hostility. Even to this day, campaigners cite this case has been an unprecedented cover-up of police corruption and airport drug syndication.
Then there are the Ray Cooper revelations. Former head of Australian Federal Police anti-organised crime operations, Ray Cooper, revealed that it was well known amongst his colleagues that unwitting passengers were regularly used as mules to traffic narcotics. Police were linked to those operations. There were narcotics, particularly cannabis, being moved from airport to airport by syndicates, and the baggage handlers were playing a key role in it. Ray Cooper, former head of the operations of the AFP Internal Investigations, revealed that it was well known by the AFP that unwitting passengers were being used as drug mules to shift drugs between airports. He also revealed that his investigation suggested that some federal police officers were in league with the smugglers. These are not isolated cases. There is also a long history of airport baggage handler drug syndication and AFP corruption. Wayne Seavers was a member of the unit at the time. You had um, theft of drugs, you had people running with criminals, you had uh, prosecutions that um, were compromised, you had um, a range of corrupt activities. The most recent allegations of systemic corruption came from former federal detective Alan Tashak, who claims a long-standing cell of corrupt federal detectives has been ignored. He began an inquiry only to have it shut down and handed over to the Sydney office where corruption was endemic. It's to, it's to discredit the informants and, uh, and cover up the AFP's activities in Sydney. Many observers believe that the government's political motive was not only to avoid international difficulty within Indonesia, but also to avoid scrutiny of the AFP and airport corruption, with this inevitable domestic political fallout. Commissioner Keelty's comments, which were devastating for Chappelle Corby, made no operational sense at all. In fact, they conflicted with operational reality. But politically, they made every sense. That may be hard to accept for some people, but it is absolutely clear. But there have also been cases where baggage handlers at Sydney Airport have been arrested for, for using, you know, innocent human mules to carry drugs aboard for them. Yes, I, I mean, I don't know about that. You'd have to talk to the police. You'd have to talk to the police. You'd have to talk to the police. And two other operational points on the AFP. From an operational perspective, the smuggling of 4.2 kilograms of marijuana would surely have been of serious interest to any police force anywhere in the world. But there was no investigation, no raids on the Corby home, no arrests in Australia, nothing. How could this be? Perhaps the answer is that they knew she was innocent. If, they, if the Australian government really believed for one moment that marijuana was being sent from Australia to Indonesia, they would have had to have gone to Chappelle's home and searched it and searched a car. And they didn't do any of that. Police actions usually speak louder than words. The complete absence of a police investigation could only mean that they already knew the source of the marijuana and that it wasn't Chappelle Corby or her family. This leaves only two possibilities. That it was hastily placed by a member of the baggage handler syndicate or that it was placed in Chappelle Corby's bag in Indonesia. And exposing either would have been politically damaging to the government at the time. Then there are the missing CCTV tapes, which Chappelle Corby begged for. 
but which the AFP were unable to provide. Why? Here we have an airport which is a major gateway to a Muslim state with the post 9-11 sensitivities in play, but more, a massive drug operation on the airport at the very same time that Chappelle Corby passed through. Yet no CCTV tapes? Are we really supposed to believe that? Perhaps the real reason is that the tape showed that Chappelle's bag was empty when she checked in. I am official. Detectives of the four. They knew earlier on why the girl was going to court. Out of corrupt drug smuggling ring at an airport. And on the same day she flew overseas. But these so called honorable men, they let the evidence flow in a breeze. transport minister took nine months and arrogantly dismissed my questions, refused to answer them and refused to indicate who was even responsible for the security cameras at Sydney Airport. In fact, he did a punches pilot, Alex, and washed his hands and has now passed the poison chalice to Senator Ellison. Labor backbencher John Murphy and a spokesperson for the Justice and Customs Minister, Chris Ellison, told AM the minister was unavailable for comment, but he is considering a response. Yes, that I don't honestly know, and I just can tell you what I've been told. I mean, obviously, I'm not the minister for the tapes. I'm not the minister for the tapes. I'm not the minister for the tapes. One single frame of an empty bag would prove that the drugs were placed either after check-in or by the Indonesians in Bali. Any police agency in the world would have an interest in the source of 4.2 kilograms of marijuana. But in Australia, there was no AFP investigation and apparently no interest at all in identifying those involved or responsible. Perhaps they knew that any such investigations would prove Chappelle Corby's innocence. In contrast, the AFP were very interested in helping to seize the much needed book royalties launching a serious investigation and intensive surveillance operation. The operation was successful. Chappelle Corby's desperately needed funds were seized under proceeds of crime legislation. In December 2005, the police leaked a bogus story that photographs had been found which implicated Chappelle Corby in criminal drug activities prior to her arrest. The reality was that a petty criminal was one of many Australian tourists who had their picture taken with Chappelle while she was actually on remand in the Bali prison. The setting of some of the photographs was also obvious, but regardless, the story was run with shocking support comments from the AFP. If any evidence existed about Chappelle Corby, there was always a risk that it would come to light eventually. These photos do not appear to have been taken in a prison setting. The truth, however, eventually emerged. But the AFP had already helped to associate Chappelle with drugs in the public mind. Yet again, they had helped to turn public opinion against her.
Last year, South Australian police seized the photos from McCauley's house and handed them to the federal police. The 60-year-old says he only met Chappelle Corby whilst on holiday, after he and a friend attended her trial and struck up a conversation with Corby's mother. She came out and she said, oh, you're here to support Chappelle. Naturally, we're Aussies. They're the two people that we met, offered to buy me a drink, and they just seemed two nice blokes, and we just sat and have a chat. McCauley says the pair later went with Ms Rose to Kerikaban Prison to meet Corby and to pose for the photographs. He says ever since news of the pictures went public, he's been accused of prejudicing her appeal, which has made him physically sick. An angry Rosalie Rose travelled to Adelaide last month, demanding police release the pictures. She's still furious at those who suggest Macaulay and Corby knew each other before their Bali meeting. I had never known myself to cry so much. I was just so cranky that people just bluntly, just straight out lie like that. Both Macaulay and Ms Rose say the police knew where the photos were taken and should have revealed that publicly. The leak was also made during Chappelle Corby's appeal process and is considered to be a major contributory factor to her sentence being reinstated at 20 years. Chappelle Corby found out that she was back to facing 20 years in Krobokan jail last night, but her lawyer visiting the prison today said she was still shattered by the rejection of her final appeal. Both men blamed the Australian government and Federal Police Chief Mick Kelty for the appeal loss, saying that the emergence of photos showing Chappelle Corby with another accused drug trafficker had influenced the judges. No action was ever taken against any police officer as a result of this extremely damaging leak of false information. In Australia, Ackley is responsible for policing the place. In 2010, a formal complaint was lodged by a member of the public against the AFP with respect to Chappelle Corby. Details of the exercise and the final report were obtained by Hidden World Films in 2011. The investigation was entirely bogus. It comprised of an Ackley operative creating a script developed with an AFP officer. Almost all of the details recorded in the tiny report were demonstrably false. It was signed off by a functionary who was at the heart of the Howard regime during the Chappelle Corby case in 2005. Both the lack of the AFP investigation into the source of the marijuana and the missing CCTV footage clearly indicate the innocence of Chappelle Corby. Whether the marijuana was placed by baggage handlers or by the Indonesians in Bali, the political implication is huge. So you're saying in effect it's their job to do the bidding of the government? Um, their job is to work within the framework of, of policy, subject of course to not breaking the law. So is it their job to do the bidding of government as long as it's legal? Uh, in my view, it is. We have hugely damaging and ridiculous statements. We have missing evidence. We have repeated failures to investigate. We have leaking of false information to the media. We have failure to help her defense team when requested, and so much more. Given the sheer volume, it is hard to see how this could be considered to be anything other than a political campaign against a citizen in desperate need of help. 